The following podcast contains adult language and themes. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there. So we're coming to the end of season two. We started the season taping our very first episode right here almost one year ago to the day, where we posed the question, where do we go from here? Well, we had no idea of what was yet to come. It was a roller coaster for a lot of us, but we had some great education along the way, especially right here through the show. You know, each week we ask our guests and panelists to come share intimate details about their lives, their experiences, and their feelings, all in the spirit of genuine openness and vulnerability. So it would be inauthentic for me not to do the exact same. Divorce. That was always a topic we planned to cover this season, and the only way I can do it authentically is to share my own experience, even as I'm navigating these waters myself. I've often talked about being divorced from a previous marriage, but I've yet to share what has been at play in the background through most of this season. But the challenge is it's so much bigger than just speaking objectively. It's speaking above and beyond the now and my raw feelings while still honoring those feelings. It's not implying details or storylines. It's not about that. And I hope by now you know that's just not the spirit of this show. It's about the human element. It's rarely black or white. It's rarely about who's right or wrong. This isn't about villains or victims. It's not about heroes or saviors. There are no winners in divorce. Everybody loses something. So as public as the world tries to air all the dirty laundry involved with a divorce, that is not something I care to do. And that's not what we're here to do today. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to unpack it, where we share our feelings and talk through how we get there and what we do to survive it. I'm not trying to paint a picture of anything other than where I'm at and how I feel, and largely what I've already experienced in the past. Because there is a major question that looms, and it seems to be universal. When it comes to divorce, you want to ask the question that plays through your head nonstop. Is this the end? And I wish that day for you to pick up the phone, gotta call me, I'm home. Find a safe space and turn up the volume. These folks are going there. Taboo topics are back on the table. So welcome to a very unfun episode. Uh, We have some really awesome guests today. Everyone's here to share some stories. And yes, what you heard me say at the very beginning, you're probably now going to want to go back and rewatch some episodes and look for clues and blah, blah, blah. Don't waste your time. I will say, yeah, that's been in motion since almost the very beginning of season two, but we were co-producing episodes together. So, you know, any of that drama you're looking for just is not going to exist. But hey, you should go back and watch every single episode, share with all your friends, get all the detectives on the case and see what you can figure out. Where did it all go wrong? I don't know. Okay, so first, let's (laughs) introduce our guest. We have with us one brand new face and voice on the show. On the end, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Joe Yensel, uh, the co-owner of the Cole Center, and going to be here to talk about relationships today. The Cole Center sounds really familiar because he is married to somebody on the other end of the table, Dr. Y herself. Reintroduce yourself, please. Hello, I am Dr. Jen Yensel. I am the co-owner of the Cole Center. And we've been married for, we've been together for what, 25 years. Yeah, close to that. And have four kids together. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to test the strength of their relationship here today on the show. And whoever wins, they either get to rub it in our faces or we get to tell them we were right this whole time. It doesn't matter. Uh, other divorcees joining me are on both sides of me returning from the recent mental health episode is Natalie. I'm Natalie Dubnak. I am a licensed occupational therapist. I am a divorcee, and I also provide mentorship for people going into a new chapter of their lives. And uh, she always forgets to mention she's also a mom. Even I though am that's a like a mother, also 
<laughs> I have two children. They still exist. <laughs> yeah, they still exist. And one of the returning guests who's always a great time, my uh, who I want to be when I grow up, if that ever happens, to my left, Mr. Peter Toomey. Oh, God, but no pressure, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I am Peter. Uh, I'm a dad of two and grandfather of five and a uh, couple of months past a final hearing from a special lady. But I'm sure you're going to ask about that. I think we should talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is one of those, like, you know, for me specifically, this is an unfun conversation. And as I stated earlier, it's not because I don't – it's because I have to talk about it in the most general sense while I'm going through it. And usually I get a lot out of these conversations. Today I feel like I'm here to help us navigate – a conversation at a level that doesn't quite suffice what I'm looking for. But it would be, like I said, just inappropriate to do it any other way. So today we're going to talk about the inevitable but just heartbreaking topic of divorce. Um, when you're married, it feels like everything you've been working towards, you've built your life around this relationship, right? It's not just this compartmentalized piece of your life. Uh, on the end, these two disappear. Maybe this is why you're still married. <laughs> what? You went, eh. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, okay. Except for the fact that you kind of co-own a business together. Yeah, okay. You can divide that pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. I, maybe I will learn something from this episode. <laughs> okay, so yeah, but in a lot of cases, it feels like you know, it, you didn't compartmentalize. It wasn't like, here's my relationship. I keep this at home, stored away neatly, and the rest of my life is a separate entity, right? It's like there's overlap in every aspect of your life when it comes to your partner, more often than not, for me specifically. Um, and everything's enmeshed within it. This podcast, this isn't a business. This isn't uh, a friendship. This isn't a hobby. This is this passion project. And still, that was couldn't have been more intertwined with all the relational pieces, which is what made this season nothing shy of a miracle that we're at episode 24 to even get here, right? Um, and so when that ends, it kind of feels like everything is ending, some form of it. And I think there's some truth probably to that. Um, according to the American Psychological Association, approximately 40 to 50% of first marriages ended in divorce, which this was not my first. This was not your first. I believe that was your first. She was married at 12 years old, so it had to be. Um, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> Jesus Christ. She looked at me like, hey, really? Yeah, you do you. It's all good. Are you Mormon? No, she, it was not her. She was not 12 years old. Um, the divorce rates for second marriages are even higher, obviously, with the approximate like 60 to 70 percent. Uh, and that doesn't mean, though, that if you're saying, well, half marriages, 50% end in divorce, that means the other 50% are successful. That does not mean that whatsoever, right? Um, what is your guys' overall feeling on divorce? I think things have changed from a societal standpoint, right? It's not, it's not as stigmatized as it used to be. But it's also this thing that seems to loom everywhere. And there's, I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar business. In the psychology field, I mean, you guys do couples therapy and you see people talking about um, wanting to get married, being married, post-marriage. What's kind of your high-level thought or view on divorce as a, as a phenomenon in our culture? I think if you answer like, divorce is a phenomenon. I think we have to look at what is marriage. Like marriage can be also a phenomenon. And like what that means to people also probably I think correlates to what divorce means to people. So I think my definition of marriage and divorce are probably interrelated. Um, so I guess I, I, I'm going to throw that back to everybody else. Is think, that, what no, is the I mean, definition of marriage to everybody? And what does divorce mean to everybody? Joe? Right. Um, and this is being, like, recorded on the record, by the way. Whoa. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what marriage is. I, I know what our marriage is. Um, and, you know, I think 
as time has gone on and relationships are different than they used to be and expectations of relationships are different than they used to be. And not one definition works for everybody. I like, I think of, you know, a good Italian husband that whose sauce is the best. Yeah. Well, my grandma's was Chef Boyardee <laughs> and her grandma's was, you know, something else. And when we talk about relationships, I mean, just the complexities of those things and, you know, how we define them and how many people are involved in them in romantic relationships is way different than it used to be. And then we talk about friendships and kids and how we define those things. But, you know, I think at the end, our marriage is based on two individuals that we try to respect each other in our decisions. And, and that's where it comes from. Peter and Natalie, would you say your definition of marriage changed from the time you were in the marriage to now being out of it? Oh, hell yeah. How so? Well, just because time goes by. Um, Joe's comment struck a, a, a nerve that um, my view of my relationship uh, changed over time. And I think society's view of relationships and and more important and, and that's at this level but more important uh, people's views and expectations and um uh and and desires of what's coming out of that that one-to-one -one relationship change over time yeah we change as humans there you go as individuals so of course the relationship is going to evolve devolve whatever you want to call it how about you? Is it, what's your view? Has your view on marriage changed since you were in a marriage? Yes, it has. <laughs> so when I was in my marriage, I didn't have anything to compare it to, aside from you know what I grew up with, and then also, you know, the merging of the two families. And so he grew up a certain way, and I grew up a certain way. So we would each compare it to what we knew, and then we were trying to make ours work and. You know, when I was in it, I was trying to keep it together. And it was from a place of like, well, hey, I heard this works and I heard that works. And so I was trying to keep something together that probably should have fallen apart earlier, you know, or sooner than it did. But um, now that I'm out of one and I'm on the other side, I can see, you know, all the, <laughs> all the red flags or things are like, oh, this could have, you know, I have a different perspective on yeah. it. And I have a greater appreciation actually for a, a relationship, a marriage. There's so many things I want to jump into in each of these, but let's start high level. The history of divorce, right? So, you know, Again, it's all based on marriage. Marriage was seen as this, you know, it's a religious right to many people. And it was seen as like, you're doing this in front of God and, and all of your friends and family. This is not something to take lightly, which I don't necessarily disagree with that idea, but it was just one of those things that was almost impossible to get back in the day. I think one of the most famous ones was Henry VIII, right? He, he, wanted, he wanted to have a son, he wanted kids, his wife couldn't do it. So he had that, like the, one of the largest legal battles in, in uh, the 1500s, he has to fight the Pope because he will not annul the marriage. And so he essentially makes himself the king of the church and Anne Boleyn comes in and that whole story plays out. Um, and so in some ways, I actually think divorce is a very good thing because it's a tool that was not always at our disposal, not to be Henry VIII, but for example, uh, even in modern day Iran and some of those countries, women cannot file for divorce. They cannot, the man has to offer the divorce. And so that's, so it's used as kind of a control as well, which again is tied directly to how they view marriage. Um, and so in some ways it, it's a freedom that I think I kind of, even as it sucks really bad, you kind of appreciate that it exists. Are there any other like historical pieces of divorce and marriage that pops into your mind when you guys think about? I think a lot this? of the traditions and the thought of marriage predates even Henry VIII. And mm -hmm. we're talking about Roman culture um, that a lot of those things. So we're talking about a contract. Yeah, They weren't 
by love. It wasn't, they were arranged. So we're bringing people together for a bigger purpose than just that. So, um, and annulling those marriages had to do with breaking contracts. Right. So we're carrying these traditions that we don't really understand and even indoctrinating our kids into them at an early age. And, you know, like, we're going to play wedding. Or I'm, <laughs> yeah. at a, I'm at a pre, like a play date with my kids when they were three or four. And, you know, parents were saying, oh, they should get married. And what are we talking about? This kid is, they're just having fun and they're re relating to each other. And we're already talking about how can we couple these people and have this relationship that, the, you know, and we're setting them up for this. I think something else to think about with marriage is that there's also, like, I think we're all heterosexual, um, that same-sex marriage has been, and even, like, interracial marriage has been a different thing. So I, I don't want to, like, diminish that and the impact that has had, but there is a lot of benefit to the marriage where, you like, if somebody, if you're not legally married, you can't, you don't have some rights. So I think I don't want to undermine that. Um, though I think when I'm thinking, when I'm using marriage here, I'm thinking of, like, what my, what I deem to be a marriage and what I think of, like, the emotional part of a marriage. Um, and that, to me, as somebody who's very privileged, it doesn't have to do with the legal stuff. I think if we weren't legally married, I would still feel married to you. Yeah. And that doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't wear a wedding ring or anything like that. Like, sure. it doesn't, it's right. a mental state. Right. But yeah. there's... Marriage is universal across the globe. So it's not just a Catholic or, you yeah. know, a Christian ideal. There's people being married that are agnostic and they're yeah. just, I mean, that's, people believe in coupling. Right. Marriage. <laughs> marriage is. So, yeah, because a lot of it was survival too, you know. You're better off if you're going to tackle this world when you got somebody by your side. And so I think a lot of people would, would probably define a successful marriage as like beyond just a best friend. Of course you want it to be, but like a partner, you know, it's like in a lot of ways, even if there's no contracts, it is a business. It is a business uh, agreement. It's a, and, and that's like, okay, you're going to handle this. I'm going to do this and you're going to get this and I'm going to get this. And that's why even though you enter into it so romantically and so uh, oftentimes, so, you know, intimately, the the degradation ceremony of the back end is is where it falls apart not only publicly it's just it's just it's so opposite of what the original intent was is i think why divorce feels like the worst thing in the world even though again i i see value in it being being there but i think it comes into how we look at marriage so for the women on the panel did you like growing up, like Joe was saying, did you did you pretend? Did you play bride? Did you pretend uh, you know, you were getting married? Did you marry off your dolls to each other? <laughs> did you marry off the Barbie that looked like you to a Ken doll or another Barbie doll? No judgment. Like, you know, that's no, important. No, absolutely not. None? No. I I, I, I could no. have guessed that, but I didn't want to make assumptions. No. Did you play with G.I. Joe's instead? I I did not. I was raised with a lot of trauma. It was not it, there. So the idealizing marriage, it was not a goal. It wasn't, it was not anything that was like, oh, this is, so I don't know what I played with. I mean, I played out in the dirt and the mud and cooked and baked it, you know, like yeah. I did other things, but it wasn't, I never fantasized um, or even compared my family, the people who are happily married to, oh, this is what I want. I think that can be a dangerous thing. Sure. All right. So. Um, be honest. I'm going to be very honest. So I didn't grow up with good role models of yeah. a good marriage. To be honest, my parents are still together. Um, I don't know if I can say happily, but that's not yeah. my business. Um, but growing up, I didn't have an example of it, but I had people around me um, in my family that had good marriages. So, I mean, even as a kid, I can kind of tell them, like, well, that's, that doesn't seem right, or that's not love. That's not what love is from what I, you know, thought it, at that age. But um, I did grow up with my cousins, and we would play house, and I knew, like, as a kid, I would fantasize, like, okay, when I have my 
family, when I have my husband, I'm going to do it this way because I know that this doesn't work. And obviously I didn't think of this at like the age of six. Sure. But like, you know, as a teacher, I'm like, oh, I can't wait till I have a family. I couldn't wait to start a family because I'm like, I'm going to do it. You know, because my parents would always say, oh, wait, wait till you have yours or wait till you get married. I'm like, I can't wait till I do it because I'm going to do it different. And I did in a different way. <laughs> and and the thing is, like, even, you know, I have three sisters, and even even the ones that were more girly than the others who would who would kind of, like, play wedding or they would try to marry me off to my cousin and, and you know, even them, it was never modeled after my parents. You, because I think a lot of the idea of marriage is what we see in the movies and we see in Hollywood is, like, a young pretty girl and a handsome – you know, like Disney fairy tales. That's marriage. This is some old boring people who hate each other, you know. I didn't see a lot of correlation between what they thought of getting married and what a wedding was and and what it ended up being. And I think, to me, that's very telling of how people still to this day view it. They fantasize about the wedding day but put no thought into what comes after. And that's just my personal observation. I found a uh, survey about why people get married, and it's love, making a commitment, companionship, and then it goes down to, like, financial security. Yeah. So, you know, we can be in love for sure, but it needs to have more there behind that, and I don't think when we jump into the $20,000 wedding or more. Oh, $20,000? <laughs> yeah, you guys got married 25 years ago. Uh, you mean the still runaway. throwing a number Yeah, $200,000 <laughs> wedding. Yeah. Or it was what? fabulous. It was fabulous. It was great. Oh, $20,000 is all I would want, yeah. Yeah, but we we put this pressure on ourselves to have this this fairy tale. Yeah. And there, we don't get to the difficult pieces of being married when you start a family and you don't have, you have to make choices about, are we going to get groceries this week or are we going to pay the house bill or what are we going to do and how are we going to navigate that and deal with all that stress? Or they hand you a kid at the hospital and say, you're on your own and you don't know what you're doing and you spend three months awake. <laughs> and that, that's, that's great I'm so glad you said that because because that was my next question is you know especially now modern day knowing that the divorce rates are high knowing that the odds are against you why do people still get married I'm not saying people shouldn't I'm asking each person here why did you get married I'd make a global observation first to the comment Joe made about parents talking about kids at three or six or whatever getting married again. I think that reflects a uh, uh, what I, I feel is a pretty global expectation that that's a good way for things to happen. You know, you made the comment a minute ago that it's good to have a partner. Well, I think you know, globally, that marriage is the, is the right way, or, or at least formal partnering is, is the right way to go, the, easy, the best way to go, the easy way to go kind of thing. Um, I'd also agree that uh, people come into it and go, oh, you know, let's have a big party and, yeah. oh, God, I got a home with you after we get, you know, they never think beyond. You know, you, you made a great point. Okay, not never, but they aren't fully looking at. I, I didn't, you know. When I uh, I went to college, uh, there was the, the girl back home that I dated when you know, we were in high school a little bit, and then it kind of grew from there. And and well, what do you do when you get out of college? Oh, you get married, hmm. you know. And yeah. you know, well, I guess the first thing you do is get a job, you know, and then you can buy your first car, you know. But then you get married, and the the um, kind of getting locked into that thinking can be pretty darn dangerous. But I feel like it's more so expectations. You know, it's like these expectations that whether it's societal or cultural yeah. or your own, you know, I know um, I personally, I was like 30, 
I'm 35 now, but when I was younger, I was like, man, 30, I, I want to do all these things by 30, which is so ridiculous. But I wanted to finish school. Okay, what's next? I want to buy a house. I want to, you know, I have all these things that I put that pressure on myself. And, you know, now I look back, I'm like, why was I in such a rush? And why is a marriage part of your, like, life goals? Because that's not something you can fabricate. I mean, you can, and that, that's why we're all sitting here today. <laughs> that is something you can do, but a relationship has to be, unlike a job search, unlike all of these other things, hobbies that you can, like, make a step towards making it a happy reality. It's not something. It's, it's an organic thing that has to, it involves people other than yourself. And it has to be as equal as possible. And that's why, so one of the things that I've just noticed, and I'll probably say this again on future episodes if, if, uh, if we get there, is this the end? I don't know. Is there another one coming? I can't say. So the reality is like you have a lot of people, and I think it's women because women are told like success is this. Remember, even one of my favorite movies that has such a good moral tale to it, It's a Wonderful Life. Like when he never existed, now his lovely wife is an old maid working at the library. Like what a failure. Because yeah, it was either or. And that's yeah. my point. It's like you're an old cat lady if you don't. Or you're this quirky young girl, you know, eating breakfast in front of the Tiffany's window. You know, it's like that is not a – that should not ever be like this like benchmark goal as far as like I want to be married because the problem is – and I've noticed this a lot and it's – it's not any one person's fault. It's the cultural norms and the expectations, as you said. You need to be married. So women, a lot of women have not only planned out their entire wedding down to the dress and flowers, they've picked out the tux. They just got to find a guy who fits into it. I can't imagine how that would go poorly. Like they've already basically built their entire lives without putting into the equation literally 50% of the formula. Yeah. And so it's more of the idea of I need to accomplish this more so than I would like to have a really happy, you know, relationship and partnership. And so I think, it, you know, and of course you're taught that it's not your fault. Like if you're put that if that's put in your mind and you don't have an easy time looking outside those norms and parameters, of course, you're going to perpetuate that same story. Sure, line. because that's that's key. It's in Natalie's point earlier about how, how she learned what to exp expect. Uh, the you know the, the shrinks would know better than I, but I spent a lot of time listening to people <laughs> telling me that he's paid you know, a lot of money and he wants his goddamn money. I have, by right God, you. you know when you're this big, you know those giants in your life are are are, are critical to your survival because you know, you have this sense that if they weren't there, I'd be cold and, and hungry and I and when you're this tall and when you're this tall and when you're this tall, you know you're looking at those giants in your life and the way they do things must be the way things get done and consequently i want a girl just like the girl that married your old dad is you know more true than you might realize because that's where i learned you know yeah. and i'm not talking necessarily about my dad my mom but i think that's how humans learn mm -hmm. so we come to that and if that's what we're seeing reflected around us that's why my comment earlier about you know, kind of societal expectations that this is the right way to go. That's what we grow up and into, and then we end up right where you said. Yeah. Hey. Well, I think the term successful marriage is thrown around a lot, and I don't know anybody knows the answer to what that definition is. And is a successful marriage one that lasts six months and you were happy and then you walked away from? Is one like at the wedding where you're the last one standing on the dance floor because it's been the longest be a successful marriage, but really you can't stand each other other times of the day. Like we, we measure marriage on its success and we never ask the question, what is success? Mm -hmm. So if it ends, is that a failed marriage, which is the other term, but maybe it isn't a failed marriage. Maybe it was just time to end. For the two people still married at this table, wouldn't you say your definition changes every day? I mean, in the in the in the sense of it, what made it successful yesterday might be different than what you guys have to do to make it successful today. 
Well, I think we, I think you have one foot out the door on this one over yeah, here. I would I think, start. Yeah. Did you sign a prenup? I'm just kidding. We had like, nothing to no, sign. But I, think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, no, but I the think the lint in my pocket. We were goes talking to, to you. family a few weeks ago, and we were kind of joking about the fact that your parents are all on we're all on three or four marriages sure. each. Yeah. And you have multiple siblings that are all half siblings. Yeah. So we've, I made the comment that I feel like I've been married five times bec- to you because it's, we've changed so much. And your multiple personalities all play right. a different totally point in each week. <laughs> See, but that's Do you the think point. success changes? Sorry. No, go. No, like, I, I don't know if, like, I don't know how often I go, like, oh, is our marriage successful today? Like, I, like, are you happy? Are you living the life that you want? And then I go, am I, li- are you, am I happy? Am I living the life that I want? So success is, are we, are we individually happy? I don't know Not how, happy, but. Yeah, happy is a weird construct. Yeah. You're always. But fulfilled. I'm, am I we, f- fulfilled and am I pursuing a life? And I think I'm just doing it with somebody who I unconditionally love and I, I believe unconditionally loves me. So I think success is not, it's hard to have a successful marriage without too individually successfully I think it's a bad term happy. would be my I, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I don't know if I measure it. I think that's a dangerous thing because, to do. Because even what you define as fulfillment each day might change too, right? Sure. Right. We're not the same 25-year-old people that got married we have four kids that are almost that age now. I mean, it's like we had a change. And I, I think I would throw out the word successful marriage and I would throw out the word failed marriage because it's not it's not fair. And those are black and white yeah. terms. Right. It's either yes or no. And there's nothing in life that's yes or no. Yeah. But I feel like, yeah. too, you're each going to grow individually and as you're growing individually, are you guys growing together or are you guys growing apart? I feel like that's important to note because, like you said, when you guys got married, whatever age it was, compared 24, to now when you have yeah. the children, you guys are like different versions of yourselves, but you're still together. Yeah. And you went through it together and made that commitment to one another. So maybe the term, and maybe one, it doesn't have to have a term, but maybe the term you might use to somebody who is trying to take a, a temperature check without asking the wrong question is like, it's, is it a healthy relationship? Yeah. And I think the more that you grow together, are growing individually and together, it is an organic, healthy thing that still doesn't mean is going to last forever Mm-mm. or couldn't even end tomorrow. Like there's so yeah. many things that could end it, For sure. but that also doesn't make it a failure. No, right? I think that's, I think it's the failure is when we don't acknowledge that. And when these things end, if they do, we look for villains and we try to find retribution and we forget. And I'm saying this as somebody that hasn't gone through it. So forgive me if I'm stepping on something, but we forget the person that we loved and we cared about and we start to talk to them as it's their fault that we're having this failure or we need to feel better about the failure because we were in the right and we villainized those people. And that's, I think, the real failure in the marriage. I think that goes to, again, this cultural and even universal idea of when it ends, it must be because somebody didn't live up to what they were supposed to do. What do you see when you're doing couples therapy and especially if somebody's working through a breakup of any sort? It's a load. I mean, well, the, so I think there's, so we have, there's research on what makes the marriages succeed and fail. Uh, like, uh, you can't use that word. Joe doesn't like it. Healthy. Sorry. Please what? stop doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the Gottmans, What makes right? it successful is when a woman listens to you right. and understands. You follow direction. Makes I agree. Successful. I'm delightful to be married to. Like, there's nothing to argue about that. She um, would say that too. Yes. That wasn't funny. <laughs> Yet Dr. Another, y, pissing off other panelists. Uh, yet, an, yet another woman telling me I'm wrong. But. That's no. called a trigger, and you are re-traumatizing him. Thank you. I can help you. Let's take some deep breaths. Uh, no, I, I think, again, it's very unusual that when I'm doing couples therapy that I'm not recommending people do individual therapy on their own because I think it's so much pressure to go, I'm not happy unless our relationship is happy. I need you, like... 
one of the big things with relationships is that everybody can self-soothe and and be able to know their own triggers and be able to regulate. And everybody knows how to, you know, how to communicate. I know how to ex- express my concerns and frustrations and likes and dislikes without kind of questioning someone's character, right? Or like, the, or um, those bids for attention. There's, we know that there's all these things that go into a healthy relationship. Now there's caveats, right? Severe mental illness. There's all sorts of reasons, trauma, like that, that, I would say those are out, maybe not outliers, but I'm not looking at that when I'm talking about couples therapy. Sure. Um, but there are certain things that we know make it successful. But I think I always go back to what is a marriage? What does that mean to somebody? Yeah. And to me, it's uncondi- what, the, hanging out with somebody <laughs> legally who you unconditionally love. And if I unconditionally love somebody, it's, I just have to figure out how do I, what, how do I want to be treated and how do you want to be treated? It, there isn't, and there's there's things to do that. But if you don't, I don't get a lot of people in couples therapy who are like, I unconditionally love this person and I want to do things. Really? I, I don't think it's the first. It's when not I'm the like, first hey, notion because they're yeah, there is, because somebody is mad at somebody. Yeah, I wouldn't say we do. I mean, I, I do get sure. that. I say that for sure we do get that. And the sooner people come, awesome. Pre-marriage, all of that. Yeah. When it's really... I would say ugly, not ugly. When people are past a point, sometimes they forget that they do unconditionally love somebody. You made a, mm-hmm. you made a good point a couple weeks ago when you were talking about middle ground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go well, you can expound upon it, but you talked about, like, if you consider middle ground way outside my middle ground, we're never going to get there. So I just want him to be, meet me halfway. Well, nobody ever defines what halfway is, and we're always arguing or yeah. missing that mark. I when just, halfway is defined as, I need him to be a different human altogether. Right. Or he's just meeting me halfway. You know, <laughs> I have trouble paying attention sometimes and don't notice the dirt on the counter. But it's not intentional. But had she been a different person, she would think I'm being intentionally difficult. Yes. And I'm not. I'm trying my best on a daily basis, and that's our goal, but I miss things, and she's focused on it. I remember when I, in my previous life, my previous job, they they left a paper clip behind the door, and they wanted to see if the cleaning people would get it, and it sat there for weeks, and every day they got more and more angry about this paper clip on the floor. I can't believe they're not cleaning it. Well, they, they missed that they clean the entire rest of the building. They just didn't close the door and look behind it. So in marriage, if you're hiding paper clips around your house yeah. and trying to trap them, that might be an issue to work through. Because then you're probably just trying to validate your own feelings that already exist based on something that you're not giving the person a chance to either hear why you're upset and, and see what they can do or accepting them for who they are. There is no amount, like abilities and skills, you can ne- you will never learn to be in a more observe, like observing person. It is your personality. That is an ability thing and that is baked into you. Right. And you the- can learn how to, uh, for example, if there's tasks oriented to it and you can put some things like, hey, listen, when the dishes are dirty, don't put them in the sink, put them in the dishwasher. Okay, she's giving you no credit. I'm saying the what average I, human being. What I'm saying though is that I I have to I have to stop asking him to like, like using the kitchen as an example. He, I don't think he, you're never going to clean it the way I want it clean. Right. And that's okay. That's who you are because you don't see it and I want it to look like a model home. Yeah. And that's okay. But we you're are more related. important. Jesus, I, what? T- I said we are related. My good guy. <laughs> <laughs> but you're more important. And so if I'm really if I I know when I want the house more yeah. clean and and I will walk into a different door of the house <laughs> because I don't want to see it because it feels personal. It's and not your there's fault. a paper clip back there it's that's not your never fault. been touched. That's right. not, why is that? Why would I? I so, it's a good reminder to look at the bigger picture of yeah. things. Like, yes, that's like a small thing that bothers you. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of good qualities. Of course. And you're like, I'm Absolutely. not going to overlook all of that just because of that minor and that Absolutely. is a subjective thing that bothers you. Instead, like, and the people took it upon themselves, like, oh, this is actually me being bothered by something, as opposed to this person doing it. 
You know, it's like he's not intentionally doing that never. to bother you. Would never. And it takes that kind of unconditional love to be able to step back and say, oh, I get it. I do want to touch on, though, one thing that you said, and I think it's a very important um, point, is when it comes to couples therapy, that's why it's so important to do it together as opposed to single because – as soon as you're separate, you are putting you or you, whoever the therapist might be, in a position where your goal is to help this person. But if their goal isn't to be helped with the relationship, but to walk out of there feeling validated and, and reaffirmed in their views, that's what they're going to take. Because you because you often tell them, oh, you feel really hurt. Why do you feel hurt? Tell me about that. And they'll walk out of there. My therapist also agreed that you hurt me and you're an asshole. You know, it's like, that's why... Like, if your goal is to uh, win the fight or to be right or to be uh, validated in being pissed at your partner, you can find that anywhere. Like, but that also means your main goal is not to work on the relationship. And that needs I, – I just feel like that's such an important point that – because it's more often men, I think, culturally – who are like, I don't want to go to therapy. Like, we can just fix things ourselves. We're obviously equipped for it. My dad had a successful marriage. He beat up my mom every night, and they stayed together for 57 years. So, yeah, couple therapy is really important. It is one thing that will – it's not that it's going to stop you from getting divorced, but it might push you to make the right decision sooner as opposed right. to drag things out because that's how it's always been done. I would say there's – at least at our practice, we do have a lot where it's one person sees one therapist, another person sees another therapist, and then there's the couples therapist. And we'll all get together and talk because, oh, this is this person's story. This is this person's story. And we're role modeling that we're not, this is everyone's lived experience. It's not, we're never going who's right or who's wrong. But we're role modeling for them. Oh my gosh, this is their experience. And how do we bring that together? So I think there's no, when done effectively, it can be really helpful to have individual and couples, especially when we don't know what's going on. I agree. Yeah. I agree because personally, when I was in my marriage, um, that's what our – so I'm a therapist, but I would go see a therapist because I think therapy is a great thing to do and to have a therapist, to have somebody that um, – isn't related to, doesn't have a, a certain opinion or anything. It's nice to have a neutral person. So um, when we went, we went together our first session, and then we would go see her individually. I right. stayed committed to seeing her and whether, you know, it was his choice if he wanted to go or not. But the intention was to see us separate, to kind of get a feel for, you know, where each of us are coming from and then come back together. But I always wanted him to want to do it, not feel like, oh, I'm going to do it because you told me to, because then I just feel like it's not taken seriously. Right. And we once went to a therapist and it was that experience. It was like a referee. That wasn't a therapist there. It was a referee because I was sitting there. I was like, this isn't even real life. This isn't, this isn't. And I was like, this is not what I thought we were going to come here for. And, you know, we didn't have a successful experience there. But also both people have to want to go in there. Yeah. yeah. You have to be willing to listen to what the other person has to say and right. not – if your mindset is, um, no, screw you, I'm right and you're wrong, and you can say whatever you want, but this person's eventually going to agree with me, uh, I think you're doing it wrong. You're not there for the right reasons. Yeah, you're not. Uh, but you also might not be in a marriage for the right reasons either, so, you exactly. know, you don't know. <laughs> I think that's the yeah. what comes out sometimes yeah. in the individual therapy with the couples is that as someone gets healthier and more self-reflective, they realize that, they're better. They deserve better than what this marriage is. Yeah. And that, I would say, is success mm -hmm. because now I'm a healthy person and I need to end this relationship, which isn't a failure because I'm a better person now and I'm better prepared to go into the world and find something I deserve. Yeah. I think and, a huge And failure. you've taken away the, the, the friction of the situation that, you know, yeah. th that you need to end because that that's just debilitating for both parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Natalie said that in uh, the mental health episode that, like, you can't expect 
to get healthier if you're still in the same environment, the thing that's making you sick. And for a lot – I mean your marriage has the most impact on you if you're in it, you're fully immersed in it. Like that can make you the best version of yourself or at least enable that possibility or it can, you know, be a toxic environment. Um, what are you guys willing to share? I'll start. My first marriage, I want to know why people get divorced because it's not – there are the common themes, but it's usually way more layered, right? It's usually a recurring theme that sh rears its ugly head. It's sometimes one simple thing, but that, again, goes plays a lot into why people get married in the first place. My first marriage ended because – we had the inability to communicate effectively, that we had – the longer we were together, the more we grew apart in our life goals, the more we grew apart in just kind of what we wanted from the other. And there was so much frustration and friction, as you said, towards the other person. And by the end, when it actually ended, it doesn't mean everything went so smooth, we were both so tired we ended on a high five. I was like, do you want to just – I mean, because we did the therapy. I'm not saying the therapy was – we, we tackled it very differently, and there was a very different mindset. Uh, one person was a little more screw you than the other, but none of it was based on hate, and I think it rarely is. I think you're so hurt you go more inwards. But by the end, it was like, I'm fucking tired. How about you? Yeah. What if we just like split the shit and call it a day? It was like high five, and it was like – I can't tell you how relieved I felt that day moving forward. There were still some shitty times, but it ended because we wanted different things. We were growing separately, not together, and we had a harder time seeing things from that person's point of view. And of course, a marriage cannot survive like that unless it's put in the background and you're like, I mean, I'm married, but that's not really who I am. What are you guys, are you guys willing to share any thing about what led to a demise of a relationship? You know, I have two children. Well, we had two children. And, um, you know, I had this idea of what it would be like to raise this child. And the child came and we, we entered parenthood on equal levels. Like I was never a parent before. He was never a parent before. And so, um, I feel like sometimes when you do have children, it brings things to surface even more. Things that maybe weren't loud before become a lot louder. So, um, you know, I was willing to work on it, push through. And he he was too, because we both said, like, we're in this for the long haul. Like, we're, we both had that attitude. But also, I know I was thinking, like, well, okay, that's so great that he's in it and I'm in it. But we're not happy. Like, we're not happy. And then, you know, time was going by, and I'm like, well, maybe this is a rough path. Maybe this is a rough patch. It'll get better because that's, like, the hopeful side of me. Um, you know, and I, I did want more than one child, you know. So um, we we ended up having two kids, and, and then we ended up having another house. So it's almost like we were doing these things, but nothing was changing. And I was, I just felt disappointed. Um, I was just like, this isn't what I had pictured for my life. And I feel like I'm doing life with a person that we're not on the same page. We're not even on the same book anymore. And now it's not just me. I'm not just thinking for myself. I have two children who are relying on both of us. And I feel like we we're doing them a disservice. And I didn't want to like repeat things. So I, I, yeah, I knew it was time to, to end it. I, I want to say something. First, thank you for sharing that. And secondly, um, I think the one thing that people forget about is, you know, hindsight's always going to be twenty twenty. Like, it's, it's nearly impossible when you're in it to recognize the difference between a red flag and loving someone unconditionally and trying to learn to work through a character flaw or a clash of personalities. I think it's easy after the fact to be like, I should have recognized right away that he was an asshole because of this, you know. I'm not saying you're saying that. But a lot of times, you know, because people would be like, Matt, you know, with the first marriage, it's like, didn't you notice this? I'm like, yeah, but 
that's also what unconditional love is. It doesn't mean you don't work on it, but yeah, I knew these flaws going into it. You love someone despite their flaws. And so it's really, it's almost impossible when you're in the relationship to go, this is a red flag, because then everything's a red flag, right? It, it's We have such a hard time with nuance in those relationships. So I think, give yourself credit. Sometimes we look back and go, I was so stupid. But also, I think it's important to give ourselves grace and say, at the time, I thought I was doing what made the most sense, that I was being kind and loving them in spite of this and trying to find a new way to care about Joe, even though he's a messy bastard and will never clean the kitchen. Peter? <laughs> well, um, I, I had a couple of conflicting thoughts as, as you were talking. Um, That's usually how people communicate with me. <laughs> <laughs> do I love him or do I want to punch him? Yeah. But uh, because nobody's perfect, you, you're right. You know, we, we, we pick people and think, you know, I can make this work. Um, and I think this, this will be good. And... Um, and yet, because of the way we were raised, we have these expectations, we have these, these, you know, uh, yardsticks, uh, okay, well, how's it compared to, you know, to, compared to what I'm thinking, and we, we tend to do a little judging, and, um, uh, I know I did, um, and that makes it hard sometimes to, um, give up the judging because that's different than the judgment. Yes. You know, it's different than what I thought, it, but it's the fact that I'm yardsticking. You know, yeah. you give up the judging, and and because you realize you're doing it, and instead mm -hmm. just go, okay, wait a minute. This is somebody that I love unconditionally. Great term, you know. And we got this going on. Well, which is bigger? That you know, is it the the this going on. Or is it the fact that I love this person unconditionally? And I, I'm I'm not good enough about going, oh shit, I don't love this person unconditionally. And come on. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be the two of us, maybe even against whatever it is that's going on. Um, because I think there are times when I didn't cling cl closely enough to her as a partner. Mm -hmm. Um and have the two of us go, wait a minute. You know, we're talking about this, in our case, again. Uh, I think most cases. <laughs> yeah. We never argued a day in our marriage, but we argued today, it's over. You know, but, it, it, you know, is this really important enough? Um, and and we, we just kind of got, we got stuck. Um kind of going back to the, whatever the top, as a matter of fact, there was a time. Uh, Joan was, a, a, I think, a, a great family counselor. And we were in there for a decade. <laughs> yeah, work, working on, and finally it, it came to, uh, you know, the two of us were sitting on the couch and Joan's sitting there going, okay, what do we want to work on today? And we said, this, whatever the hell this, it doesn't matter, whatever the hell this was. And Joan went, wait a minute, you want to talk about this? Yeah. Again? <laughs> oh, because we've talked about this, people, and I thought we'd resolved this, people. Why are we talking about this again? Because we hadn't, we hadn't come together enough to be able to deal with whatever this was. And you know, either and that doesn't mean that, that that this wasn't wasn't important. Wasn't wasn't. It doesn't mean that this was more important than the unconditional love. Oh hell no! And that's the, the problem. Yeah, it feels that's the problem feels, because yeah. we got stuck into this, and that was the word. The next word Joan said. She said, "You're stuck. You're back again talking about this. You're stuck. We've been around and around about this. Yeah, we, 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 I thought we had a deal about this, and now we're back talking about this again." And we had gotten maybe not more focused on this, but just we'd lost the, it's the two of us against any of this you want to bring up. Yeah. And then I feel like, too, when we would go through, you know, 
uh, periods of time where we weren't seeing things eye to eye. Also the environment during that time. So um, we were just growing apart more. So it almost felt like we were roommates inside of the house that we lived in with our children and trying to, I just felt like I was playing house again. Like as a kid, you know, I was like trying to make sure, you know, in front of the kids, everything's fine or um, try to touch on subjects after work or, you know, at, in the evening. But then it would be like, I'm tired. I haven't going to go to bed and in the morning. Well, I have to get to it. So it would just get pushed off and the communication um, was not effective. And yeah, the, the relationship felt like a roommate type of situation. And, um, you know, it just created a greater um, separation, like a greater wedge. And I, I'll touch on this from previous relationships. You're talking about the yardstick. I think that was a great way to put it because the yardstick causes a lot of problems. And take away the judgment for a minute. The yardstick is a measurement of success. Oh, how come we're not doing this? Or how come we're still doing this? And it's this constant like measuring of something that Two, these two people are never going to do that. You know, it's like you can't you can't measure success of a relationship based on this cookie cutter mold that is a successful relationship. And so you have somebody who'd be like, if oh my god, if my grandma knew that we did this, she'd be so like she'd be devastated that um, you know you don't clean the house or something. You know, it's like whatever it might be, the, the yardstick needs to go out because you, the two people enter the marriage are like every relationship is unique exponentially because you have two people who are also unique and not like anyone else. And the yardstick thing, I think, is just that that cultural expectation. And and one thing that I've heard many times, and I, I've worked on it because I I kind of see how I play into it is like. Remember how you were like when we were dating? It's like, yes, you want to go date him? Go back in time. Build a time machine. Because <laughs> like the, I would, our relationship was different. I evolved. You evolved. The relationship evolved. However, I can see it's like, oh, the th you know, sometimes you unfortunately evolve past the things that the other person really liked about you and vice versa. But like the, it's the measuring stick, I think, that often gets in the way of actually saying, hey, you know what I would really like? I'd really like this. But instead we go, oh my gosh, we were so romantic back in the day. Yes, because, you know, we were horny for each other. We were young. We barely knew each other. Now we see each other sitting on the toilet. Like some of that's gone, you know, but we can find new ways of capturing what you need. <laughs> <clears throat> Joe, um, <laughs> Have you never seen her sitting on the – don't answer that question. What, <laughs> what would you say is a common – one or two common themes of why people call it quits? Ooh. I'm not looking for data here as much as oh, what you've seen. Oh, I can't do not do data. Okay, do data. <laughs> well, people keep score, <laughs> right? Huh? Keep people score. keep score. And they dig huge. in. Yes. And yeah, they... contempt. Contempt. <clears throat> the four horsemen. Yeah, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? <laughs> contempt and – I think, un, excuse me, expectations. Of the person, of what marriage is, Both. everything. Yeah. Both. Yeah. I mean, if I put an expectation on, on you or the relationship, like I have to communicate that and someone else has to agree to it. And a lot of times people are like, I have this expectation. It's in my head. And if somebody doesn't meet it, they suck. And I'm like, oh. You, that's you? you no, I've been there. You've been, <laughs> you've been, that, been there. The no, I've, I've been yeah. there, yeah. 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 So yeah. you talk a lot he about like, thoughts been... and feelings, right? Yeah. And how my thoughts and my feelings don't always communicate into the world. Yeah. So I have my own feelings or thoughts about something, and I ex put those on expectations, and then you fall short of them, but I've never told you. Yeah, right. that's not nice. So then tomorrow you have resent I have resentment because you didn't meet that expectation. And then I do it again. Right. And then 10 years down the road, it's too it's much. It's too much. And I've put too much weight on this relationship to solve problems that it can't solve. That's huge. I think, like, in my personal life, in any of my relationships, even non romantic, that is a recurring theme mm. is that I find people want you to be a mind reader because, in their, in their assumption, they've communicated what they want. But 
I'm a, you know, everyone has a different communication style. So like, not only do you have to learn theirs, but try to get them to learn yours without there being so much friction that you can't get past that initial. What makes you vulnerable? I was going to say. It makes you vulnerable to have to tell people what you want. Yeah. And then either they're going to do it or they're not. It's a lot easier just to assume they will and then be disappointed internally. Just to be clear, he's being sarcastic. <laughs> no, no I, I am being sarcastic. He is, but he's actually making a point simultaneously, yes, which yes. is the beautiful part, but which I, is obviously the only reason you two ever ended up to, with each other. Because knowing her the little I do, now it makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think we I wake up and I I'm completely dumb to you. Like I think that it's it's dangerous to think I know you better than I know myself. And it's hard enough to be human and a mom and a working mom and and but a wife, let alone and to figure out my own stuff, let alone to figure out that I know my stuff and I know your stuff and you also know my stuff. Like that's bizarre. So like every I'm still day, learning my stuff. Right. <laughs> I'm so we're still like learning. Yeah. So I have to communicate because I don't even know what I'm thinking, let alone and it's not even what you're thinking. It's not even that people like that's I think that's what people get caught up is like I told you. It's not that you weren't communicating. It's that you weren't you effectively understand. communicating. Yeah. Because you know, it's not like we have those headsets from, uh, what was that, Demolition Man, where you can just kind of have sex with each other through the brain and have conversations. We should do that. <laughs> you, you should. It, it takes away all of the risk of contracting sure. COVID. We have and shells STIs at home, too. Yeah. <laughs> and the three shells. Yeah. So you have seen her sit on the toilet. Okay, perfect. Oh, God. Inside jokes. That's Back to the topic. Of Come on. Here, it's, 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 I don't think um, you have. You know, but that, that, that thing I about under, on you. Under, understanding the other one uh, <laughs> was there. Uh, and it was, uh, we really ought to replace this couch. And, well, yeah, but the budget right now that we're on, you know, doesn't have the new couch in it. And it, and it was heard that we're, we aren't, we aren't going to get a new couch ever. And it, right. And I didn't mean that. What I meant was, I don't, I wish I had said, I'd love to get a new couch. Um, let's try to figure out how to work it into this budget that we're trying to live on. Um, and and yet it was, yeah, we're never going to get a new couch. And, uh. and, and I think we're all guilty of it because communication, I mean, the thing that defines it is, is a two-way medium. Like, you know, like you, you have the person who has to accept the information and a good communicator kind of confirms, did you understand what I was saying in some form or fashion? Or offers back, uh, you asked for this and this and this, I can give you the one, but um, the, the second one is, is, is going to be a problem. Let's think if we can do the third one like next week. Right. And come back with what, what I can give you out of what you asked for. And we say, okay, well, one and three is good enough for you now. So yeah. let's keep talking about that second thing, and we'll try to work that out too. But so there needs to be a. I heard it, and here's what I can do out of that. Right. And here's what I, I think I need from you. But it takes uh, again the vulnerability and both people be being able, receptive. That's just right. Receptive. To be able to, and it's hard to be that when feelings are involved and there's any frustration or anger or resentment. I think reminding that like you're on the same team. Like you're not. You wouldn't. It's not like. Because it's you're not about this. It's not about the couch. Yeah. It's not the nail. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's not, not about like you're nail. not trying yeah. to mess with me and be like, ha ha, you can't get a couch ever because I'm like your parent. <laughs> like that. I, like I know. You have to remember that, yeah, yeah. that you but have good intentions. That's what I was going to say when you guys were talking about communication. That's definitely a piece. And people are capable of communicating. Sometimes it, with the communication is the level of emotional maturity. Yeah. So like. Wow. Yes. When sometimes when you're having like these conversations, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes one of the partners might fall short and it could be the either one, you know, it depends on what topic or what thing you're discussing. So that level of maturity plays a big role too, because like how you said, if she or he thinks like they're never getting a couch, well, you're reacting at that point. You're not even pausing and like having a conversation. And it's not always, it's not always, uh, I, I agree. It's more oftentimes like the EQ and the willingness, but sometimes it is literally learned behavior because mm -hmm. I consider myself a great communicator and, and I have been shown with like evidence right in front of me reading a text. I read words that weren't there 
because I'm like, last time this happened, this person said this. And I'm just saying this was even with a friend. I'm like, you said this. It's because you're trying to say I'm an asshole. And it's like, where did I say that? I'm like, let me show. Well, fuck. Okay. Well, I am an asshole, but for a different reason. You know, it's like, so because emotions are involved and emotions are never, are rarely logical or rational. And so sometimes it's maturity and sometimes it's just raw emotion that is, you're filtering all of that through. So of course, it's always going to be tough. But I think what makes a marriage healthy versus unhealthy is at all times, not every single uh, communication, not every single day, not every single moment, but the overarching thing is we are on the same team. Because as soon as it's you versus me, you can drill down that hole and it just, that's where it all goes awry. Driven to distraction, living on emptiness. To help us through the breakup, the musician spotlight for this episode is on Bronx based singer songwriter Gabrielle Sturbens. Starting off singing in her high school's gospel choir, she went on to tour as a backing vocalist for Weedis and Mike Doty as well as late-night TV appearances with Robbie Dupree and Lord, Gabrielle has also opened for Weedis as a solo artist on three international tours. During the pandemic, Gabrielle began working on her forthcoming solo album with multi-platinum producer Philip Jimenez in his Long Island studio. Finding herself back in her childhood hometown, she remembers spending much of her time alone in her room singing along to Linda Ronstadt, Ella Fitzgerald, and Aretha Franklin. This album is set to release in spring 2024. The influences of country, the American songbook, and gospel are still evident in all her music. You can find her at gabriellesturbenz.com, S-T-E-R-B-E-N-Z. all kind of talked about some reasons that it can kind of blow up and end and the thing that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the it sucks breakups suck breakups of any kind um, you know losing a friend sometimes can feel harder than than anything because you have somebody who you cared about who cared about you and even if you walk away from each other as enemies uh, which is actually harder. It, it, it doesn't change what happened in the past, but but now you're trying to like figure out how it fits into your world. So like, let's talk about some of the things that suck about getting divorced, about a breakup of any kind of like long-term relationship. I'll say one thing is 
at first, I hated telling people. One of the things that I don't think most people think about, unless you're like out there trying to get people on your team and hating the other person, which of course is never how, you know, I would operate in any kind of relationship. I just hated telling people. In fact, I think I texted you. Did I text you or did I call you? I think it was electronic. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a dirty secret. It's almost like there is some form of degradation that goes along with it. You know, like we're talking success and failure. Even somebody who does not buy into all of those norms, who doesn't measure it that way. Like I actually had, and some people could disagree. I don't know. I will tell you my most recent marriage, I would consider it a successful marriage. It ended. That doesn't mean that it was a worthless waste of time. I have no regrets about it. It ending has sucked, I mean, for, for both of us. And it is like one of the most painful experiences ever. But there's this part of you, of these people you've let into your life, and there's that overlap. So you've also let them into your relationship in some form or fashion. And telling them is like having to tell them that, you know, you killed their cat on accident. It, it's just, it's this horrible feeling. And so I didn't want to tell anybody at first. If I could tell them in person, at least I could like, gauge the reaction because there's some part of me and it's not pride. I don't know what it is. And maybe the therapist on both sides can tell me what it is. I hate uh, when people give me pity, if I, especially if I don't deserve it. And I didn't feel deserving of it. I just felt like I'm in a shitty situation. But everyone's initial thing when you tell them that is going to be oh my God, I'm so sorry. Mm. Like, oh, that hurts. Oh, that. Yeah. And you're like, ugh, ugh. like that makes me want to throw up. Right. But I, I'd rather someone just be like, actually, Peter's response was the perfect response. Um, we need to grab a beer. That was it. I'm not saying he didn't say anything after that, but that was it. And that was the perfect response. But I also cannot put my expectations of how people respond to it on them. But you can. You can say, hey, listen, I don't want you to go, oh, I'm so sorry. I want you to go, congratulations. I hope you're happy. When you know but what I, I mean? didn't want that either. I didn't know what I wanted. I wanted to not tell people. You're right. Right. right but, but then you're also trying to control the narrative and the communication with that person. But then you have to backtrack if someone goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And you're like, no, 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 it's good. This is a good thing. So, uh, pu so put the good thing up front. Put it up front. Yeah, I, I, what you're saying. Right, so communicate when, that. When, 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 when we sat the kids thing. down. Or maybe it's it not is. a good thing. Yeah. I'm really broke up about it, but I don't want to hear pity about it. Sure. I did do that. And I felt yeah. even dirtier doing that because I felt like I was controlling <laughs> you're what they to wanted to boundaries. naturally feel. Yeah, you're see, allowed you're to set your own boundaries. I, I understand. But it's also like if somebody tells me something, I want to tell them how I feel for them as a human and as a friend. But you don't know. Well, no, I'm saying like I would sell, look, everything's fine. It's amicable. It's blah, blah, blah. I just want to let you know. But it's like I found myself over explaining when I should have just been a grown, you know, a grown man and said, I just want to let you know this is it. And just accept what comes back. The fear was someone was going to be an asshole. And there were a couple of those situations, even if they were trying to be funny. There were two people who were like, what'd you do? And the one guy, I didn't know very well, and I just said, ha, 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 fuck you. The other person, I said, if you weren't my very close friend, I might punch you in the face right now. Read the room. Yeah. So I think that also was like, I also don't want that nonsense. But it's like, I'm asking for the impossible. Don't react. You're not asking for anything, though. I know. I was sharing information because I felt like I had to. I guess that's why it sucked, because... I didn't want to talk about it yet. Yeah. Sure. And, and I, I would expect that you'd be concerned that I'm going to feel sad Yes. for you. Yeah. And because you're my buddy, you don't want me to feel sad Yeah, it's like this anything. is already ruining my life. Why would I let it ruin yours? Let me, you know? I know. L let me just say, all right, beer. We're going to sit and talk. That's, a, that's, because, so that's my point, is I should have given people the grace and, and been able to say, oh, I trust these people. To, they know me well Oh, my enough. God, he's learned something. Okay, good. <laughs> that Peter likes beer. It's like, hey, Peter, uh, I got a new job. Let's grab a beer. Let's grab a beer. <laughs> hey, uh, but, Peter, but, it's but, snowed but part today. Of Let's that, grab a beer. Part of that, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I fully support you know, that there's a way you can set it up to get more of what you want 
out of the exchange. When, when she and I uh, had decided, um, we sat my two girls down who were in town and said, um, uh, you know, hey, come on over Thursday night because we want to talk a little bit. Well, <laughs> they knew what the news was going to be. All right, so that wasn't the issue. But it was, we've been working on this. We've been struggling for a decade. We had good counseling. We're still stuck. We're not going to stay stuck anymore. But we're not going to fight. So we're hoping that you two won't think that you need to pick sides out of this. That's good. And instead, uh, you know, just keep making the invites, keep sharing your information, and we'll do what we can do. Well, you know, like 10 days later, uh, parents of the, the the football player, lacrosse player, are like, well, it doesn't matter. We're sitting in the stands watching, and I sat on that side of them, and she sat on that side of them, and the four of us watched the game. And it's worked, and I love her for it, um, because uh, she was big enough to, to be able to, you know, to make that and, and, and let that work. But we, we were very intentional about uh, your great point. What do we want out of this right now? Mm -hmm. And we wanted to keep those five grandkids. Yeah. And we wanted to keep the, you know, the two sets of parents. So, okay, how are we going to do that? Well, tell them what, what we don't want and tell them what we do want. And uh, God bless those kids. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's working. Yeah. I think kids probably makes it harder than anything to have it because now it's like, you know, me, I don't have children. So when my relationships have ended, it's not that there's not all these things that tie you to the person, but kids is a whole different dynamic. I can only imagine that makes everything that much more difficult because there's still like, uh, there's a connection to that person in more cases than not. Right. Yeah. So, um, my oldest is seven and my youngest is three. So, um, you know, a seven-year-old has things that they do and a three-year-old has things that they do. So um, co-parenting with two children and doing it in an amicable way um, has challenges, but also keeping the mindset of, you know, what's most important, you know, being able to honor boundaries and also yeah. look in the in their best interest not from you know my just my opinion and also respecting him because at the end of the day that's their dad so whatever my feelings right. are towards him and vice versa the children shouldn't be you know collateral damage between that yeah. so um i think that's something that we both did a good job at and it didn't happen initially like right away sure. it, it was you know trial and error and getting used to things but um yeah the best advice would be to just keep them at the forefront keep your feelings because my feelings of him as a husband is different than my feelings of him as a father and as long as they have a healthy um supportive father in their life that's great for yeah. me and that's great for them why is this one is? Yeah. It takes somebody with, with uh, a lot of emotional intelligence to feel that way because separating the person as a spouse right. and a parent or even as a spouse and a person, as a friend, as whatever, I think it's hard for people to do because you're when it ends, of course, you're focusing on all of the reason that it ended. And if you're doing it, in an unhealthy way, you're focusing on all the things you don't like about the person, right? Instead of seeing the good in it. I mean, I, just me personally, the way my brain works, I don't ever want to look back and be like, well, that was a waste of time, you know? Like, because it's not. Even some of the bad things in life are good learning lessons. For me personally, um, when I was going through my divorce, all my friends were women who were in marriages. I didn't have a divorced friend. Um, I remember when I was talking to my one therapist, I was like, I don't have a person that I can, you know what I mean, that I yeah. can ask for advice. So I'm, I feel like I'm just like learning. And it's so funny because my circle now is so different. And so there's yeah. there's things that come up where I was like, okay, 
because I just want to hold on to them because the, to me, they're my babies, right? But then I'll have a friend who's like, hey, my daughter is this old right now. And when her dad wanted to do this, and it, it's just so nice to have people to rely on. Yeah. And it's not like you're going to them for everything. You're, you know, you're using your judgment and making the decisions for yourself and your family. But it helps alleviate some of the things because some of it is just a fear, you know, like an uncertainty. But then when you have somebody to like kind of just talk it through and then get a different perspective, I'm like, you know what, you're right. You know, I'm going to try yeah. that. And it helps. And taking and having a filter, having enough confidence from within to have a filter because mm -hmm. you'll get somebody who wants there to be sides and they're like, right. I always hated that person. Yep. And there's that person or there's the person who, you know, maybe you have a religious friend or family member who's like, you should stay married for the kids. I'm telling you, I hope you guys relearn this. And so having that filter that says, what happened happened, and I am confident in my decisions, and here's how I'm going to move forward. But it is nice to have support. You know, I, I actually, when I got divorced the first time, I was expecting some blowback on from some of the more staunch conservative family members. And even the most religious of the people in my world were actually very supportive. I think probably because they saw the issues, but also like, you know, the only person who just didn't know what to say, and a lot of people don't, but my dad, who just didn't have the depth, and I think in his own way, he was being as supportive as he could. He just like, all he could say was, I just never wanted to see any of my kids get divorced. And he kept talking about it so somber, and I'm like, yes, but if it's for a good thing to move forward, and it's not that he was saying you shouldn't do it, it was just, you know, that was probably the only, th that was probably the only even like, I wouldn't even call it negative. That was the only like neutral thing. Everything else was like, I'm sorry for you, but I'm here for you. And that was great. But Peter, what what's one of the worst parts about divorce? Um, there is the, uh, the inevitable f uh, feeling of failure sure. um, because no matter how we came to it, um, you know, cultural expectation or, 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 you know, whatever, 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 whatever. Um, at some point we said yes. And, um, and then whatever we did in between that and this, uh, you know, we, we, we put ourselves into it. You know, we invested. Um, sometimes better than others, sure. Sometimes more surely than others, sure. Um, uh, but, you know, we, we had skin in the game. And this is now something that um, I was not successful at. Uh, so um, th that hurts some. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the loss of, of a friend. Yeah. Because um, although we ended up stuck, we had some really good good years, you know, and, uh, we came together in middle life and, you know, at that point, who knows, you know, but here was somebody that, hey, this is, and chocolate, dark chocolate. Okay. We got something to start talking about and we built something from there. Um, and, uh, and had a lot of good times and made, you know, good friends because, and that's another part of it. It's not just, you know, you and, and her or him, you know, him and her, you know, it's this, the, the, the intimate circle around them, the closest friends around them. And, um, and, and that hurts, you know, when, uh, when you have to recognize, uh, I didn't make that. I, 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 yeah. Uh, no. The, on, on my part, the, the hurt has been uh, mitigated because those friends uh, have been great. And, um, you know, they, they heard the same, we're not fighting, we're hoping you won't pick. Uh, so um, when, the, um, when the, the dinner club from before, you know, decided, hey, we got to have a picnic because of this, the, the one couple is back from their European trip. We've got to find out how that went. We all came. And um, 
both she and I got big hugs from, you know, everybody else in the dinner club. You know, it should have been because it's the dinner club. Come on. These are the people we spent all those evenings with. But, but you never know. You know? Yeah. And that's the kind of thing you're putting at risk when you go, hey, Matt, this didn't work, you know. Um, but in, in our case, uh, they have all been uh, extremely supportive. And, um, and I think that's, you know, to the next question on your list, you know, what do you do after, when you're facing the stuff that sucks um, is, is look for those kind of people that, you, that can be there for you and will be there for you. Yeah. Uh, don't expect it because you don't know for sure and you'll have a little disappointed, but, you don't know. but be open enough. Don't be so far into your shit that you don't let somebody who can, you know, support you. That's kind of what I was getting at myself. And I think it's because, and this might be, I don't think it's unique to me. I think it's kind of universal, but mine was extreme. And this is both marriages, but even the first one that was like, it was kind of a happy ending when it ended was I put so much of myself into everything that I do, every relationship that I just felt like I lost so much at the end of it. And like, you know, I think that's important to share because I, I can't imagine I'm the only one. And some people might go, oh, well, then maybe you didn't know who you were. Now, I've always known who I was. Like, that's something I think people know about me. Like, I know who I am. I have this inner confidence. But it still feels like you're drifting at sea sometimes after the fact. Not because you don't know who you are. But I don't know anything else about the world as I knew it. Like, I've, I've now – I'm now a um, – I'm now a foreigner in my own world. And because there is, I don't know how some of these former friends and family are going to react. I don't know what this means. Um, is Peter going to drink me under the table? Like, you know, there's all these things that we don't know about. And sometimes the unknown is fun and, and adventurous and breeds curiosity. But sometimes it's like I am so emotionally exhausted. I need some kind of like solid footing. And um, the term limbo is kind of could, – could kind of encompass my – parts of my post-marriage timelines. Um, and you just feel like for me, I will personally say I, both, both times, I felt like I lost too much. And so then the question is, Matt, why would you get remarried? Well, because I – it was – the marriage themselves couldn't have been more different because <laughs> I was like, I'm never doing that again. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out it ended similarly <laughs> um, in some ways, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that the two marriages themselves couldn't have been more different. And that's the thing that, you know, as somebody who likes to connect dots and learn, it's a hard pill to swallow. What do I learn from that? You know? I think it's I, what I learned that I brought to this today is each marriage, each relationship is so unique. And even if the, the challenges and the problems and all that are very different, it doesn't mean it's going to be successful or healthy. It's making me rethink what I even think, uh, believe about relationships in general, not just romantic ones. Um, but I'll say for me, and it's certainly because <laughs> I've already said I don't want pity. It's not for pity. It's I want to share because I, I want other people who, who've been out there who feel that to know that you're not alone is I feel like I lost so much of myself that what was left was too little to be a whole human. And that has been the toughest thing. And I've been doing the work and I've been going to therapy and and I have people like Peter who, you know, I call him up. He's like, what the fuck do you want? And I'm like, oh, I need to talk to real Peter. He's like, oh, hold on. <clears throat> How can I help you, Matt? Like, you know, and then suddenly. And there are people like that for you. And the, the Catholic you kid. Have would, to. The Catholic kid would observe that limbo is, you know, you're there and you got a term to, to and instead I'd invite you to think about liminal space. Uh, it's, sure. it's the doorway. Absolutely. Uh, that's, it is. that's the definition. And you're at the point where there's a room behind you 
but there's a room in front of you. But what and, makes it feel like purgatory is because all the logic in the world, I can say those same words, but I don't feel it. Okay. And I'm not saying right now, but no, I mean no. in general. Okay. I can intellectualize all of these things, but feeling it, you know, that's the whole thing. And this whole thing is about feelings, right? It's about how it impacts you, how it makes you feel. You, everything you said, I agree with. My emotional side's like, shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about, Peter. <laughs> I'm just so, <laughs> Doc. <laughs> um, and you're right. No, you, but you're right. Yeah. Because intellect and, and emotion, so. But would you feel like you're grieving? Do you oh, feel it's, like you're, it's, you're in a, yeah. a, the process of grieving? And yes, that, that's something you can't think your way through or out of, really. I, I know it, not to discredit somebody who experienced a loss through a death, but it's the death of a relationship. Yes. And I, I, that, you put it into better words than what I was saying. The grieving process, I've grieved the loss of the person. I've grieved the loss of the relationship. I am still grieving the loss of myself, the pieces that I talked about. And that is a unique type of grief that has no curriculum. And it is very untreaded in so many ways for me personally because of who I am. And that is the thing that makes the grieving process harder. I will say I'm not judging myself for it. Like I, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. In fact, I told my therapist at one point, she was like, well, what's next? I feel like we're stuck. And I would go, honestly, I need to just wade in these murky waters and be here for a while. I have not allowed myself to process and just be depressed for a little bit because life wouldn't allow me to, you know? It went from my basement flooding to crazy amount of work schedule at work. And it's like, I needed some time. And so I've been through that. And it's just, for me, it's just new territory. That's all. But, but it's not like, it's not even all bad. Some of it's positive. These are lessons I had to learn. So I don't repeat some of the, I don't even want to say mistakes, but you don't retread some of the territory that isn't going to work out the way that is beneficial to me in the next, any type of relationship, romantic or otherwise. Um, so what then do you do after the dust settles? You, you've done the work. You're probably more towards the tail end of it, and I'm in the midst of it. And you deal with people doing this all the time. It's a good opportunity to evaluate what are, where am I grieving the loss of the expectations I had for this relationship and thinking about what, how you want to live today and how you want to live tomorrow and how, I don't know, I think there's a reminder that I think it's really unsettling and, and, and super insulting if I was you stayed married to me and you didn't want to be. And then people are like, oh, that's a successful relationship. I, I think that would be one of the hurt, most hurtful things you could do to me, right? We've talked about that. Um, and so sometimes it's um, a way to kind of – you get another opportunity to do what you want to do. But hopefully, you know, you do that with somebody – regardless if you're married or not. So I don't know, an opportunity to re, you know, I think your basement flooded, our basement just flooded. Tragic, mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity to start over, right? We wouldn't have done it had we not been forced to, yeah. but it's an opportunity that I didn't necessarily want, but I'm going to make the most out of it. And maybe it won't be as bad when it floods again, you know? And, and so I think, a lot of it is mentality, and a lot of it is uh, just what are you willing to do? Like at the end of the day, when you're, you know, we're on our deathbeds. What are we always say? Like, what are the three ways you want someone to describe you? And can you be that person regardless if you're married, going through a divorce, anxious, depressed, whatever, and being able to be the person you want to be no matter what you're going through? What did your rediscovery look like? You shared some things with me offline. Yeah. So, You're a very different person now from what it sounds like you were when you were married. So different. So, you know, the marriage ended, the divorce finalized. Now we're each on our own. The kids are cared for now, like we're on our new path, right? So I was lucky in the fact that um, I had an amazing community um, through fitness. And I, I chose to 
work out because it helped. It helped me during my divorce process. It helped me um, in other aspects, you know. So when my divorce finalized, um, the gym that I belonged to was doing like a tour. So they would do these trips. And um, I used to love traveling. And then obviously with children and then with the divorce, traveling stuff and COVID, <laughs> like I wasn't going anywhere. Okay. Yeah. The um, three of us were married during COVID. That alone, we should give ourselves yeah. a lot of grace for. So I, you know, I took that. And you too, especially. As I took it as an opportunity and how you said mentality. I was like, it was like a whole renewal of like a mindset, you know, um, and the fitness definitely helped that. But um, I would take these trips and other people from the gym would go. But I would do it as solo. And I wanted that time by myself. I wanted to, like, lean in and just try new experiences. I wanted to get comfortable with doing things alone. Yeah. Um, and each trip, I would have, like, different experiences. I'm like, oh, that was fun. It was just, like, building up that, that those things that I kind of lost for a period of time, you know. And I made friends. And being able to let them know, hey... I want to do this on my own. And whether or not they were offended or not, I was still, you know, it was just like so empowering um, each time. So I was lucky in the fact that I had that. Um, you know, I didn't use things as a distraction. but Which I, I think distractions to a point are mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's... But really, absolutely, yeah. I think it's healthy that you identified what's a distraction, what's the sustainable for lifestyle me. that makes me happy, for makes me, me fulfilled. Yeah. yeah, and if it felt like it was a distraction, then I would, you know, pull back. But just, you know, going through it with an open, an open mind, an open heart, not to be all closed off and bitter. Because for a period of time, I was very bitter. I isolated. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And COVID helped because we were isolating anyhow. So I didn't even have to explain, like, you know, right. like, well, you, I didn't have to explain myself because I'm like, COVID, you know. <laughs> and so that helped me at that time tremendously. But life is, life is good on this side. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're, to, if you're to have this podcast, like, a few years ago, I wouldn't be the same person. You know what I mean? I wasn't sure. at that point. I'd, and I never wanted to pretend. I feel like I did so much pretending that I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want to pretend. <laughs> if I'm not, I'm just going to be quiet. Yeah. Peter, what does... Uh, I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> what does future, future Peter look like? What what uh, What's left? Uh, what is there to do? What makes you happy? How are you finding it? Uh, busy. D different busy, but busy. Um, so uh, I've gotten more active. I, I've, I've gotten more active. I put my, more of myself into some of the things that I have enjoyed in the past. Um, community theater. So uh, they've been bugging me to sit on the board and help there for a decade. So now I said yes. And... Um, uh, the softball league needed an umpire in chief, so I said yes. And um, in both of those cases, these are, they weren't just, uh, you know, the, the, the first chip that hit the table. Uh, there were things that I was involved with before. So I'm not flitting around doing a whole lot of new stuff. You know, I want to try this, I want to try that, I want to yeah, try right. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you didn't go through like another midlife crisis. You didn't buy a Corvette. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, Call me so, when you do. Okay. <laughs> and and um, I have um, allowed the support that I had around me. Uh, I, I've allowed it access. You know, I've answered the phone calls. I've uh, 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 Frank lunch. Yeah. Okay. You know, let's go do that. Uh, and, and my guys have stepped, I, I belong to a, uh, uh, it was a spiritual retreat weekend and it morphed, that was 17 years ago. It morphed into every other Tuesday morning we spent two hours together. Um, so those guys have stepped up uh, wonderfully. And and I allowed that. I, I opened my, I, I, I recognized, you know, that liminal space suggestion uh, a minute ago was, was a realization that I had come to and I am terribly blessed by it because, you know, okay, 
what's out there that I want either more of that I, or, or, you know, and, um, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, uh, have been spent a little more time with, with grandkids and stuff. Uh, and I like that a lot. Um, so it, it's a question of, um, I think, understanding self, yeah. you know, in, in a more global, you know, that was me, uh, understanding self, figuring out what works for self, and then figuring out where are safe and productive places to to look for some of that. Yeah, there's a reason I asked the people at the table, because there's so much like emotional intelligence and maturity there, um, you know. And even myself, like I was mad at myself because I was even disciplined in the way I handled the grieving process. I was like, why don't I just go on a bender, or like, you know, do some lines of Coke and a hooker or something like that. But instead, I decided to do healthy things and it just, I pissed myself off sometimes. Um, but even what you guys are saying is really important because I think some people might, again, with their filter goes, well, that just means you can't do those things when you're married. And that's why marriages fail. And it's like, no, no, no. you could have done all these things possibly, right? But we we often are so focused on the fact that there's two people and personalities and everything else. Like, it's just the, the setting was different and that maybe we didn't think. And that sometimes we lo I lost a piece of myself because I chose to do that, not because it was asked of me. And I think it, it's important to identify those things. So I'm really happy you guys are finding and have found what fulfills you. And, you know, if somebody comes along who matches that energy, that's awesome. If they don't, you, you're both very uh, self-sufficient uh, and, and healthy and happy people. And that's, that's what's most important. Well, I, think, I think what you guys are talking about, the way you're living now that you're not married, I'm like, I feel like that's how we live. Like, I just went on vacation without him. You go out with friends. I mean, we both do things to make sure that we're being the best I don't feel like, I don't know. I feel like every day I wake up and I, it's still a choice and I don't feel judged ever by you. And I think, I don't think it's, look, we figured it all out, but I don't think, um, I think a lot of it's a mentality and a choice and an intention and dealing with our own mental health shit as well. So, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think you're right. I, yeah, I mean, I. Obviously. Obviously, you're right. Um, <laughs> it's very rare that you're not. But uh, indirectly, yeah. just showed what a healthy marriage looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also, we don't have it all figured out. No. And of I course. think that for people, th that's something I, I was able to give myself. And I and thank you for saying those words because that's part of what I was trying to describe with that liminal, be allowing myself to be in liminal space. I don't have to figure it all out. Mm -mm. I don't have to have answers. I just have, I just have to have good questions and, um, and, uh, you know, both the guts and the strength to go out and work on good answers. Yeah. I don't have to have figured it out right Having now. all the answers makes life more boring anyway. Yeah. It's just when you can view the curiosity is a positive thing again. Where there you, you go. can be excited about the opportunities that the future hold instead of trying to deter or eliminate the, the blowback or the heartache that those future things might be. And you're there. I am trying every day to get to that point again. And I'll get there. You will. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, we asked the question, is divorce the end? Uh, the answer is that's completely up to you. It's, I would say, no, it's not. What can come next, I know from having gone through it before, is a, an even more compassionate, more uh, better communicator, uh, this version of you that maybe you haven't even dreamt of yet. Maybe there's a more fulfilled, happier, kinder, more, more of an asset to the world that you that you live in maybe that's what's next and i think what everyone's shared the one thing we definitely all agree on is that is entirely up to you and so thank you for sharing your stories your thoughts thank you for um 
showing all of us men how we're the worst husbands in the world in comparison to you. And you know what else can come next is dating. And what the hell does modern dating even look like? Well, we're going to answer that question on the season finale coming up next. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. We just went there. Now you can go to the going there podcast.com for links to all the podcast platforms, our socials, and of course, YouTube. While you're at it, give us a rating, share with a friend and subscribe. Good music will help you get through any breakup. Check out Gabrielle Sturbens at gabriellesturbens.com. S-T-E-R-B-E-N-Z. You pretend that you don't see. She knew you'd give up easily. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Joe Callie and Bobby Thomas.